Welcome. This is James Corbett of The Corbett Report with your eye-opener report for BoilingFrogsPost.com. As the global economy continues to slow down, the world is being asked to focus on issues of so-called sovereign debt, austerity, fiscal responsibility, belt tightening, and other such euphemisms for the grim reality that the public is now being asked to pony up the dough for the trillions that have been handed over to the banksters in the past few years. What the constant focus on these issues effectively hides, however, is that underlying the economic woes that are the symptom of the disease is the disease itself, the monetary system. As monetary reform advocate Bernard Leotard of the University of California points out, this is not by accident. Now, how many of you know the difference between the Nobel Prize of Economics and the other Nobels. Anybody? Yes? What is it? Oh, what's irregular about it? Oh! Oh! Gee! Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that is a sufficient answer. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay. Now, Paul Krigman told me personally that it was totally crazy to talk about the money issue. He said, have you not, we were both from MIT, okay? We were graduated in the same school. We had the same professors, right? And what he told me, didn't they tell you? Never touch the money system. Never touch the money system. You can touch everything else. Never touch the money system. And the reason is there. You will not be invited in the right places, and you can kiss goodbye on the Nobel on anything else. That is worthwhile getting. You're killing yourself academically if you touch the money system. Although many are ignorant of this fact, the Nobel Prize for Economics is as much of a Nobel Prize as the Federal Reserve is a Federal Reserve. That is, not at all. This doesn't prevent the press from lauding Nobel laureate Paul Krugman for his deep economic wisdom, however, and it doesn't prevent Krugman from using his bully pu pulpit to argue for ever-growing amounts of stimulus spending in a vain attempt to plug the holes in the sinking SS global economy with ever-larger bales of debt-based Federal Reserve notes. So if arguments over sovereign debts and bailouts and stimulus and easing and other forms of tinkering with the current monetary paradigm are not the answer, that begs the question, what is? As we've been examining in previous weeks here on the Eye Opener, the question of monetary reform and alternative currencies lies at the heart of the long-term solution for steering us away from the edge of these systemic fiscal cliffs and towards a system that is inherently rational, equitable, predictable, and sustainable. As everyone who has examined the issue will attest, however, there are a bewildering array of alternative currency systems on offer, from time banks and let systems to TEMs, bitcoins, and privately minted precious metals. For those who are overwhelmed by the variety of choices in the world of alternative currency, it is important to note a basic principle that many of these systems have in common. The idea of self-issued credit. With the way our money system works, when there are plenty of people willing to work and plenty of people who need their work done, there is often not enough money to allow it to happen. Now, any group can more readily create a currency that they can use for their purposes. Say Billy wanted to buy 10 apples from Alice. They set the price to one unit per apple. In the transaction, Alice receives a credit of 10 units and Billy receives a debt of 10 units. Alice can then spend her 10 with anyone who uses the currency and Billy can make up his 10 by providing something to anyone who uses the currency. In such a system, money is created as needed by people who need it. It is being made to be entirely decentralized with rules that are transparent. With security built into the system 
as with any account today. This is the beginning of the democratization of money and finance. By examining the roots of this idea and combining it with modern breakthroughs in communication and data processing, alternative currency proponent Paul Grignon has proposed digital coin, an idea for a global economic system that operates on this principle of self-issued credit. The digital coin is really two coins. The first kind is the perpetual coin, which is permanent and created in limited supply. Perpetual coin is designed to be the value unit of the whole system, like the silver penny in the medieval example. Everything is always priced in perpetual coin. However, its actual presence in trade isn't required because commerce is conducted in the second type of digital coin, the credit coin. Credit coin is an online electronic trading medium issued by producers as virtual goods and services, just like the vouchers issued by producers in the medieval market. Credit coin is spent by the issuer in the process of creating or supplying the issuer's goods and services. For instance, an issuer that was a corporation or government would spend most of its credit coin on the wages of employees. The employees would spend the credit coin at their local stores, who would in turn buy from local or distant suppliers, who would in turn pay their suppliers and employees with it, and they would then spend the same credit coin in their local stores, and so on. Circulated and spent via internet, any given credit coin could travel anywhere enabling any number of transactions having nothing to do with the issuer, just as Anton's bread vouchers could be used to allow the seamstress to buy from the shoemaker, the shoemaker to buy from the butcher, and so on. However, unlike the medieval market, there would be no end of market meeting at which all outstanding credits are brought together to be exchanged and redeemed by the issuer. Therefore, the first refinement the system needs is a built-in incentive to ensure that every credit coin ultimately returns to its issuer. This is accomplished by offering a bonus on redemption. The issuer offers more product if the product is bought with the issuer's own credit coin. Or put another way, the issuer honors its own coin at a higher value than any other. This bonus redemption can be designed so that it is limited to a time period of the issuer's choosing. This sets a target period for maximum redemption, thus making it much more likely that the credit coin will be spent on the issuer's product and services when the issuer wants it to be spent. Of course, there would also be differences in demand for the products and services of individual issuers and different degrees of issuer reliability. Therefore, credit coins would vary in value over time and go up and down relative to each other, just as national currencies and corporate stocks do today. So the second refinement has to be a means of determining the relative worth of different credit coins as expressed in perpetual coin. This can be accomplished by an automated online marketplace that tracks the value of each issuer's coin by comparing the offers to sell to the offers to buy for that coin. At each transaction, the credit coins involved automatically access this online marketplace and revalue themselves according to the real-time demand for that coin which corresponds directly to the current demand for the issuer's actual products and services. As a basic formula, this is extremely simple. At any given moment, any given credit coin is worth its current buy-sell ratio times one perpetual coin. A perfect balance of trade always results in parity with perpetual coin. To clarify, if buy orders exceed sell orders, the coin will be worth proportionately more than one perpetual coin, and if sell orders exceed buy orders, the coin will be worth less. The value of the coin automatically adjusts to the supply and demand for that coin. 
As all pricing is expressed in perpetual coin, the issuer will unavoidably take in more of its credit coin per unit of product if the coin is below parity with perpetual coin and less per unit if it is above. Therefore, as the issuer's products are sold, any excess or shortage in the supply of that issuer's coin is automatically corrected, pushing the credit coin back towards parity with perpetual coin. This is just one of several powerful features of the proposed digital coin system. In this proposed new system, there is no borrowing from future generations. Money is not abstract, nor is it some item of precious scarcity. It is virtual goods and services, backed by actual goods and services. Spending power is inescapably linked to earning power, and earning power is tied directly to the production of real goods and services. The ins and outs of this digital coin system are complex and are best served by a thorough review of the proposal at digitalcoin.info, but the idea that it operates on is simple and time-honored. As Grignon demonstrates in his other works, just as the ancient marketplace thrived in times of monetary scarcity, a lack of silver or gold coins, by trading credits that were self-issued by reputable businessmen, so too could a global monetary system be arranged, completely eliminating the need for the outdated technology of Federal Reserve notes or central bank-administered national currencies. The implications of this system are enormous. In the digital coin system, money could be split into its function as a unit of measure and a means of exchange. Individuals could issue their own credit and allow it to exchange in the market. Speculation would transform from an endeavor to suck money out of transactions into an endeavor to add value to existing relationships and people would be free to refuse specific credits that had been issued by specific businesses, giving total control of, to individuals to choose what groups or businesses they are willing to support. Last year I had the chance to talk to Paul Grignon about this system on my radio program. And tonight we're talking about a revolutionary idea for a, a completely different way of basing our economy, not on bankster credits that's uh, owed at debt and interest back to the banksters, nor on gold or silver coins, but on self-issued credits, the idea that we can give out vouchers for the goods and services that we will produce in the future. Uh, a simple idea, but revolutionary in so many ways. And there are so many aspects of this that I find really fascinating. And, and it seems to be a system that, that really is based on the idea of, of sustainability, of of some sort of accountability, of, of inherent justice. There are a lot of things that seem built into this system, so I suggest that you go to Money as Debt to start watching the, uh, the documentary and, and finding out more about how this system works. But, uh, but Paul, let's start uh, uh, unpacking this idea of self-issued credit, because as I mentioned, there's such a circularity to the flow of this system that I think is, is really quite parsimonious, kind of beautiful in its own way, but also I think inherently it brings with it some, some aspect of justice. Perhaps you can talk about some of those aspects of, of this um, new, different mon monetary system that you're proposing. Um, the, the circularity is an attempt, I guess, to imitate nature, and it is the fundamental idea of a balanced budget. Ends are produced, and then you earn back when you sell your production. This is what we do now when you, you're you just letting the bank get in the middle. Uh, the banks don't, I mean, I, I, I get a little, I get a little <laughs> quiver when people say banks create money out of nothing. Uh, no, they don't. They, they create money against an asset, and you're promising to pay it back as the asset that they create the money against. What they are doing is underwriting you because who the hell are you? It's just the problem with self-issued credit is if I, Paul Green, I'll go out and start spending money against my production, well, who the hell am I? <laughs> and nobody's going to trust me, and my production is, is hardly reliable enough to base money on. But a large company is, and any government that collects taxes is. And so more in the collective that this would work rather than at the individual level. But as you noticed in the movie, it's open to anybody. I mean, if you can create a circle of trust, as people do with alternative currencies right now, you can have neighborhood currencies, you can have village currencies, you can have the local currency at any level. 
And these would all be technologically compatible with the larger ones because they all, as you can see, it was a total, total libertarian chaos kind of system where people only accept credit they want to accept. If I don't want to let Monsanto's credit pass through me, I could say no. It can't pass through me. I could boycott any anybody's credit I want, which would add another little arsenal to um, social social exercising the uh, the common will, you know, the people's will. Right. That's an important aspect of this, because really what in such a system, what people are trading is, is not these 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 promises uh, that we understand as money today. It's it's really a, a promise to pay a specific good or service from a specific person. So the credit, for example, might have originated with Monsanto or some other identifiable company or, or something. And you would know who it is. And right you would now know when they you borrow would be able to say no bank. if you didn't have that credit. First to accept it by legal tender laws. And you don't know whose credit it is. It's all anonymous. Uh, and in this other system, that credit would not be anonymous. Everybody who issues it be known. Another aspect of this that I, I like is the inherent ability to decentralize the system. Because, of course, right now it does function at a national currency level. And things and decisions that are made by, by politicians in a faraway place can have an effect on our savings and our ability to spend and all of this. Which, which again is is a ridiculous system on so many levels. But in the self issued credit system, if you are able, if you are an issuer, then you really do have control over over your own currency. I mean, it, it's 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 really up to you and and to your company or whatever it is, whatever operation that you're you're running. Yes, and the same for government, and in, and the way the uh, automatic, the automated aspects of it work that you could not get out of whack very far before um, the losses spread amongst everybody who uses your credit, which would make you very unpopular. And that could become a self-inflicted um, wound. And, you know, there's a strong incentive to total responsibility because there's a huge penalty for irresponsible, and there's actually no way to pile up debt on future generations. That's that's the big, big features I was looking for. All, all money is extinguished within a short time, either redeemed for product or it ceases to exist. Can't hold things over a, an issuer forever. So the the debts are the debts must be extinguished by their expiry date. Oh, there's all kinds of features. I think that people trading these credits, you know, behind the scenes, what they what they think would would, would provide an enormous amount of anonymous but useful information about consumer preferences and and, and the help the producers plan for realistically. That, that's if we were in a, an economy where instead of trying to sell everything we can, you know, because we want to make as much money as we can, our goal is simply to supply the people's needs the most efficient way possible. Right, exactly. All right, well, let's pick it up from there. Let's take a few minute break, and we'll be right back with Paul Grignon. Once again, 1 800 313 9. Obviously, we are still light years off from implementing such a system, not necessarily due to the technological impediments, though there are those, but because the idea of monetary reform is still far from the minds of the public, who are generally too busy chasing those Federal Reserve notes, or euros, or yen, or pesos, or pound to contemplate what it is that forms the basis of our entire economic existence. And if Krugman and the so-called Nobel laureates and the central bankers and all the others who benefit the most from our current economic paradigm get their way, that profound state of ignorance will never be disturbed. For those of us who do know about the possibilities of alternative currencies and new monetary paradigms to solve many of the most intractable economic problems that we're facing, it's incumbent upon all of us to better inform ourselves about these issues and to start raising the awareness of those around us before we are all driven off the bankster-created fiscal cliff. This video is brought to you by the subscribers of BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information on this and other topics, please go to BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information and commentary from James Corbett, please go to CorbettReport.com. Available now from BoilingFrogsPost.com.
You know, they, they arrested me for taking pictures. That was obvious. Well, they couldn't really write that in an arrest report. So they said, well, he was standing in the middle of the street. He was blocking traffic. DNA profiles of innocent people arrested in England and Wales can now only be held by police for a maximum of six years. The technological police state that we see developing today is the access to advanced methods and techniques of control. This technology is not the stuff of sci-fi fantasy, but increasingly a part of our everyday lives. The new Boiling Frogs Post DVD, The Police State, available from BoilingFrogsPost.com, including all four episodes of the Police State series of James Corbett's eye-opener report, two bonus eye-opener reports, an exclusive interview with BoilingFrogsPost.com member Andrew Gavin Marshall, and a Paul Jamiel political cartoon gallery. Order your copy today at BoilingFrogsPost.com.